Hello, welcome everyone to another conversation of the Altering Shifting Communing series, a project presented and hosted by Call for Curators. I am Ilaria Conti, the curator of the series, which is a series that began almost a year ago to communally reflect on the multiple meanings of the notion of curatorship. Um, the series, as some of you know, focuses on practices that foster diverse forms of knowledge that are rooted in critical thinking and work in diagonal ways, so to say, across social, historical, political contexts to provide new understandings of uh, these contexts. The series also addresses the responsibilities of curating and the importance of considering not only what we do, so not just content, but also how we do it, so how ethical the processes that we set in motion and we're part of are. And the title of the series, Altering, Shifting, Communing, is, uh, as I always say, also a statement of intent somehow toward altering the terms of the conversation, shifting ground and communing with each other. So today I'm very happy to welcome Will Furtado, Deputy Editor of Contemporary and and Contemporary and America Latina, and Diego del Barrio Rios, Editor-in-Chief of Terremoto. Thank you so very much to both of you for being here. Thank you. Um, so, as always, we will have a conversation for the next 40 minutes, approximately. And in the meantime, for those who are watching this, um, feel free to ask questions throughout the talk, through the comment section of Facebook, YouTube. Uh, we will address the questions during the, the final Q&A. So, I would say let's get to it. Well, Diego, thank you again. Um, I would like to start by just asking you to introduce yourself, your practice, your magazine, the editorial platform, and also by asking you something that I tend to ask since the very beginning uh, of this series, which is also, how are you and how have these past months been? Where do you want to start? Uh, I can do, yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Wilfred Furtado. I'm an artist, writer, and a deputy editor of Contemporary and Contemporary and America Latina. Um, very briefly, in my artistic practice, I work with images um, and text to explore uh, decolonial thoughts uh, intersected with uh, queerness, blackness, uh, pop culture, and whatever else uh, I'm interested in at the time when I'm creating things. Um, and Contemporary Art is a, it's an art magazine, but also a dynamic space uh, for issues and information on contemporary art from Africa and its diaspora, its global diaspora. Um, it was founded in 2013 uh, by Julia Grossa and Yvette Mutumba, uh, who also have their own um, parallel, pra parallel practices uh, beyond contemporary art as curators and writers. Um, and Contemporary Art is co-published by the IFA. Um, and we exist online and in print for free. And um, besides that, we also run critical writing workshops, uh, mentoring programs, uh, site-specific and traveling exhibitions, um, and, and, and several uh, other projects. Um, and Contemporary and America Latina was launched in 2018 um, and is co-published by uh, the Good Institute and, and the IFA. And um, it, it's also a critical art magazine focusing more on the connections between Afro-Latin America, the Caribbean uh, and Africa. And of course, uh, it also includes uh, a lot of indigenous positions. And, in, and I've been very well, thank you for asking. <laughs> and uh, I'm based in Berlin at the moment. Uh, I've been here for a, for a few months now. I can't really travel so much like most of the world right now. And uh, at the moment we have a lockdown, um, kind of soft, I mean, we can go out. We don't have to bring our passports to go um, grocery shopping, like um, like I experienced in Colombia uh, last year. Uh, but at the moment, uh, museums just reopened. Um, you can go to museums and galleries, um, and restaurants are still shut, and there's still a lot of business that are shut. Uh, but generally, it's like okay, it's not too bad. And I don't know anyone who's got the vaccines in Germany. Thanks, Will. Leo. 
Thank you, Will, and thank you, Laria, for inviting me and Terremoto to this conversation. And well, uh, well, I'm Diego del Valle Rios. I'm based in Mexico City. And for four years now, in March of 2017, I started as editor-in-chief of Terremoto. I'm as more an editor than a writer, but I usually also write some some places there and some in there. And well, Terremoto is a, is a platform uh, advocated to the dissemination of critical thinking around pr artistic practices and curatorial researches in the continent that we know as the Americas, with a lot of quotation marks, yeah. uh, which I'll later explain about that. Um, and well, uh, Terremoto is an independent or, uh, organization, a non for profit, bilingual. All our contents are published also uh, as free access online and in print, uh, also as free in, in 50 distribution points around the continent. And well, um, we started in 2013. It was originally founded by Dorote Dupuy, that, that is a French creator that moved to Mexico City like eight years ago. And well, um, then Natalia Valencia, Colombian curator, stepped in as editor. She and, and Dorote are the ones that started with the editorial lines and content, original contents of Cruz Terremoto, which I later continued in 2017. And well, right now, how are we? Well, we are we're struggling, but we're hanging in there. <laughs> We stopped printing because of the, of the pandemic. It didn't make a lot of sense for us to continue printing since museums, galleries, independent spaces, bookstores were closed. So in terms of expenses, it was a more strategical and coherent decision to stop printing. So our 18th and 19th issues uh, are only existent uh, online through our website. And the plan is in April to restart printing with the 20th issue. Uh, to be, yeah, it's articulation by the end of April, more or less. And well, in terms of how, how am I, well, I'm, I'm as well as possible these days, uh, still trying to understand the, the uncertainty around this pandemic situation. Uh, uh, here in Mexico, well, we, we have, as same as, as will, a very soft quarantine. Uh, businesses and some major spots of encounters such as cinemas or malls or parks are, are starting to reactivate. There is an economic anxiety around the pandemic, of course, because the, the economy of the city and the country uh, of all is very dependent on informal economy. So there's a lot of pressure to keep it going. Vaccination is slowly starting very, very, very slowly. I think not less than the 2% of the population is vaccinated so far. So yes, we're, we're still in that navigate, navigating of, of what's going to happen with this pandemic. Thanks, Diego. So you both mentioned when your respective platforms and magazines were founded. Um, they were founded the same year, actually, right? 2013. Um, I wanted to ask you, if you could tell us more about how and why uh, both your respective publications came to life in terms of which needs they were meant to respond to and also what kind of gap they've been addressing or working on um, in the landscape of contemporary art magazines, but just also in general in the field of editorial <laughs> knowledge production. So why did they come about? What was the gap or were the needs? and how you think these needs have evolved and the, the, what kind of work has been done by your respective projects on this, on these needs? Um, both Julia and Yvette worked in the, in the, in the arts um, in 2013. They are both black German women, so Afro-Deutsche. <laughs> and, um, and there were many reasons why they started Contemporary Ant. Um, one of them being the lack of representation of artistic and cultural production from African diaspora in general, and definitely, especially in, in, in Germany too. Um, but not also that, but also a need to, um, to theorize not only the art from African perspective, African perspectives, but offer also, you know, critical analysis from our perspectives, so to speak, you know, on any issue, not not just necessarily on um, 
on uh, art from African perspective. Um, but also um, the paradox of artists of African descent being accepted into the uh, dominant contemporary uh, realms while at the same time um, having the deeper meaning of their work and recognize. So we wanted to, you know, engage with uh, with this and do something about it. Um, and also that um, to engage with the idea that there is no center of thought. I and mean, we wanted to, see, to centralize knowledge um, uh, and, and knowledge production. Um, and um, and of course, also when it comes to you know the the art world well, is not just you know a race and racism problem, but it's also uh, you know a capitalism and a race and a and a class um, issue. Um, also, when it comes to art publications, uh, meaning that perhaps I mean definitely speaking from my own experience that you know people who come from uh, poorer backgrounds are you know discouraged um, you know to write uh, about art. Very often because of the of the low payment um, and uh, and also that people who may not have an MFA or have worked in the arts previously are also discouraged to work in the arts uh, if they come from you know uh, underprivileged backgrounds mm -hmm. and so um, to also have a, a magazine that um, allows for that it, it's um, it's a way of trying to and do that um, and also include opinions from people who may not think that their opinion are, is valuable um, and in a nutshell that's that's it more or less thanks will diego well i think it's very similar to will in some sense well mm. and first uh terremoto started as a blog so and uh, very imitating the model of contemporary daily or art review in which you, we, we posted the exhibition photos with the press release or the curatorial text. As a first instance, it was intention to uh, get together or reunite all those uh, exhibitions and projects that were happening throughout the continent. Dorote was, was finishing a research trip around the region and then she, she just question like how, how can I keep track of all these uh, projects and, and people that I've, just, I've met. In that time the only magazine in the region was Artishok who was founded by Alejandro Yasmil uh, based in Chile uh, but it, it, the focus was very very specific in the south region of, of the continent. So the, Dorote proposed first the, the blog. It started as a blog until 2000 I think it's 2014, if I if I if I recall correctly, in when they started to print and generate original content uh, through a magazine that will have an editorial charter and present from 10 to 12 uh, original essays or conversations. So I will say that the first uh, intention of Terremoto beyond keeping track of the network that what that Dorote was in contact with was also as a possibility of bringing in uh, these discourses and, and opinions and reflections that were absent in the in the contemporary art editorial uh, field in which mainly in, the, in those times we will always read only north uh, media or, or media that came that came from the north, specifically Mexico, that came from the U.S., and so it was also a way of of trying to calibrate uh, the the circulation of contexts and reflections throughout the continent. The bilingual intention, well, it's also a decolonial strategy to make to make uh, reflections accessible beyond the language, even though we are still. Uh, managed by two colonial languages that are English and Spanish, well, that, that allows to the articulation of, of our region beyond the specificity of each contemporary art scene or, or, or yeah, or specificity of the of, of regionals. And well, and right now, I, I will say that it's very similar to Will in the sense of, of what is the gap that we're feeling. Uh, of course, with the professionalization of the arts, it became a requirement to, as, as we already mentioned, to have a degree, to have a master's, 
uh, to have a PhD, to be part of an academic research to, in, in order to, to be able to have a, an, a public opinion in any of the media. This is, of course, uh, something that we have inherited from the contemporary model that comes from the North, specifically from the US. So the only, uh, let's say, political subjects that were listening or the, that were being listened uh, throughout the media or portrayal through the media were, of course, those that fitted the idea of the citizen. So they have a they have a passport. They speak more than one language. They have, of course, uh, a, a degree education, and, and and they they are they have also the social and cultural capital that allow them to have a, an international or national projection. So the the gap that the remoto has been trying to, of course, fill up is all of those voices and experiences that not necessarily are in line with the professionalization of the arts, but that have been working for a while and are articulating a lot of, a lot of experiences and practices that are relevant to the, to the debates that we are, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're part of in the region. Thank you. And so let's talk about regions. Um, I want to address this because, of course, you both mentioned this a little bit uh, quickly before. Um, your publications maintain somewhat a regional focus, but they really uh, work through this notion in a very transversal way, in a very diagonal way, right? That moves past geographical boundaries. So I wanted to, t to ask you whether you could tell us more about how you've been thinking about this idea and notion of region, uh, about its potential and flexibility and also about its challenges, how you've been working also to transform it from inside out through your respective platforms. Um, when, it, when it comes to contemporary and uh, both contemporary and America Latina, but starting with contemporary and international, so to speak, um, we also wanted to engage with this idea of like, what is the regional meaning in a globalized world? And so um, our focus is Africa and diaspora, and uh, you know, in a in a post-colonial, globalized world that includes the whole world, and so um, region for us, it's um, it's it's definitely not a geographical uh, region, but perhaps more of a way of thinking, and uh, and and as we as we say, it's, it's a it's a it's a matter of perspective, uh, perspective. Um, from Africa and its global diaspora. Um, and, and what does that mean? That means that we, we feature perspectives um, from African diaspora, regardless of the location. Although with contemporary and America Latina, we do have a more regional in the geographical sense of the word because we focus more on the, uh, uh, on the continent south of the USA, um, and including the Caribbean. Thanks. Oh, well, I mean, <laughs> it's, 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 it's a challenge that to, um, <laughs> it's, it's a very gesture of power to name a, a geography so, so vast and different as it's uh, this continent called America or invented America. What is that like the, how do you call it? The, the phrase we used to present terremoto is contemporary in the Americas. Uh, recently, we, we decided that we were going to start um, typing the Americas or printing the Americas in quotes or in, in italics, a way to, to suscitate doubts around this name. Uh, since I, I will say that the editorial intention be, uh, be, behind this is uh, suspicious or a doubt of those namings that seek to enclose the geographies to homogenize uh, the population that, that inhabit that inhabit this. Uh, I mean, we have all these different names that obey to a geopolitical organization of the world called the Americas. It names it it it, it gives us a fact that the America that there is more than two Americas. It gives uh, an U.S. centric definition to the continent. Uh, it also divides it into south and north. Uh, it, so it's 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 just another organization uh, according to a Western centric understanding of of the planet, 
We have Latin America, which is also a, a name that follows the whiteness of the independent countries throughout the region. That so then uh, invisibilizes the resistance and all the other indigenous nations that are all around the continent. We have Abiyajala, that it's also a name that has been very populated through the decolonial academy, uh, but also in somehow homogenizes the the, the indigenous. Uh, existences around. We have Walmapu, that is uh, specifically the name of the land that the Mapuche people, the Mapuche nation, uh, had for its for its uh, specificity. So there's there's the Caribbean, which we, we we know that the Caribbean does not understand itself as an homogenized uh, archipelago. It's it's more of a, of of breakings of historical breakings of of colonial uh, genealogies. So. The way that we approach to understanding of the region is is of doubting all of those uh, certainties and homogenizations that try to to name the the geography, and well, the, the idea is to to break to break them to to make them uh, vibrate to make them uh, reveal itself as some just as a part of a, a huge and more bigger uh, reality that that inhabits this place. Thanks. And so in line with this, also, um, I wanted to address another point, which is the fact that your platforms, through this thinking and sort of rethinking these notions and configurations, have also become important platforms for the development and presentation of critical thinking on contemporary art in relation to colonial histories and issues of post-colonialism, decoloniality, and more. So I wanted to ask you how you've been addressing these topics through your editorial work. These are complex topics. Of course, there are many contemporary art practitioners that are working on this, but there are many nuances. It's a very fragmented or highly articulated landscape and discourses. And so I wanted to ask you how you're thinking about Yes, post-colonialism, decolonization, decoloniality, and, and so on and so forth, how this informs the contents, but also the, your, so who contributes, but also your own editorial process and the infrastructure of your platforms. Um, I'd like to add to the previous point that um, regardless of our um, either geographical or not, uh, specification of focuses at Contemporary Anne. We also really try to make global connections. Um, and so, you know, we may have, you know, someone of African descent, you know, in Asia or, or in Australia. And to us, that's still relevant. And we also run a lot of series um, on, on topics that, say, would be relevant to someone uh, part of the geographies, uh, the, the more specified geographies that we cover. Um, and so, first, we have a series on, on the Pacific, you know, and then so we have a series on artists that work in the Pacific uh, and, that, and that are indigenous to the Pacific, I mean, the islands and, and Australia and New Zealand. Um, why? Because they also um, have to face a lot of issues uh, that, you know, Africans and, and diaspora have had and still have to face. And so, yeah, again, um, our regional focus is always um, connected to, to the global and to the, to the rest of the planet. Um, in terms of the decoloniality, uh, I mean, in many senses, um, decolonization and, and decolonial thought um, is, is a critique of, of the modern and of the contemporary. And so, um, it's hard to, um, you know, like pin down exactly how we are doing that and like give you a list of, of the things that we're doing. Um, but it's, I think, it's essential to, when doing the colonial work, to think that, um, you know, the, re the, the Renaissance could not, could not have existed without, you know, imperialism. Um, you know, the discoveries would not have happened without imperialism and, and enslavement and so on. And so it's, it's very difficult to disconnect um, the idea of the contemporary with uh, decolonization. And so, uh, but more specifically, um, we started with um, engaging with the idea of what has been lost. 
what has been what and who has been overlooked, you know, destroyed, suppressed, or silenced. Um, and, and, and then move on to what can be done and said, uh, what artists have been uh, doing and, and how, how have they been engaging with these ideas and actions as well. Um, and always trying to you know, challenge these hierarchies that have been, that have been uh, constructed for us in the, in the past 400, 500 years. Um, and, and, and also contest the privilege of those who were historically um, placed as the norm. Um, and this is more or less, you know, like the framework of thinking when working in a, in, in a decolonial manner. And that, that, that can have, you know, many uh, shapes or, or forms. Um, in our case, you know, very specifically, it means that, you know, we feature um, artists and, 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 and practitioners who work with these ideas. Um, you know, including Rolando Vasquez, for instance, um, Kate Herzry, Gabriela Salgado. Um, there's there's uh, so so many so many people. Um, also, another way of doing this, or that we have, that we have been doing this, is to um, bring together different practitioners who are you know who are doing this kind of work. Um, and for instance, we run um, this series um, called Curriculum of Connections, uh, where we bring together different critical voices, ideas, uh, or projects working towards um, educational, artistic, um, and research practices. Um, and it's a space, it's an open space, um, online and in print, to learn and learn um, and together investigate all the new territories um, of knowledge systems, collaborations and imagination, subjectivities and so on. Um, so for instance, once we had like a round table um, with um, Nilika Jawardani, Shalin Khan and Felwin Fel Fel Sar, um, where they talked about teaching students new, vocab new vocabularies uh, and perspectives uh, in, the, in the internet Age, just to give you one example. Yes, that's great. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Will. I mean, I, I will. I'm following also Will in this one. <laughs> There's a lot of similarities <laughs> in between this, uh, but of course, I will say this specifically through Terremoto. Well, being a magazine founded by by white women. And me being a white editor, of course, this comes with a, an ethical responsibility mm -hmm. of how how this position of power uh, needs to be understood and understand. And well, since I stepped in, there, we we decided to make this an, a, a, an intention of or a mission of, of Terremoto, that is to repair the absence of certain voices and certain subjectivities uh, in the genealogy of critical thinking in, in the arts and culture uh, sector. So for instance, you will see that uh, a lot of our contents are mainly uh, written by uh, feminized bodies, uh, racialized bodies, or non-conforming uh, entities that inhabit this, this, con this continent. Uh, so also it's, it is a way of approaching and recognizing that our readers are mainly uh, people that are located in cities, in capital cities. They have access to culture, they have access to a certain, uh, certain languages and, and vocabularies and grammars that allow them to understand this. So there, there's also the, the, um, the challenge of, of, of questioning these limits imposed by the same uh, conditions that the city articulates to anyone that lives in it. Uh, of course, a lot of, of our readers uh, in Mexico, Mexico at least are, are white people or, or people, let's say, permeated by whiteness. So one of the intentions of the magazine relating to decoloniality and post-colonial uh, reflections or thinking is exactly to question or to make uh, uh, reflections around that that has been normalized being this whiteness as a spirit or ethos that uh, conditions and articulates and organizes what we understand as, as, as art, for example, in, in colonial or in ex-colonies uh, of, of Europe. So it's a challenge in the way of 
of making this accessible, of making of, of let's say not normalizing, but making concepts familiar to, to our readers. They're mainly uh, students between 25 and 35 years old, uh, mainly women, or at least what the algorithm understands as women. And well, the, the challenge is, is to invite those those reflections that are not only on the margins or outside the academy, but also inside the academy, but they are questioning those status quo that are being uh, understood as, as as certainties just because a museum has legitimated them or a magazine uh, of, of academic magazines has, has legitimated. So it's 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 a constant exercise of questioning this the it's our, our own position not only as individuals as part of terremoto but all, also as uh, let's say political subjects in an, in a cultural and an art system and in provoking those doubts and, and suscitating debates or, or unfolding reflections, we can l allocate how the colonial consequences, uh, the specific consequences have conditioned or had uh, nurture uh, cer certain ways of resisting to that logic. So as a decolonial thinking, since it's a continuous practice, it's a continuous process of trying to understand ourselves beyond the modern colonial uh, logic or surpass it and, and try to decolonize ourselves. What does that mean? Uh, that, that question, how can we move forward beyond the discourse? Uh, we're trying to also point out this de-association that the modern colonial logic has come, has uh, affected, in which the discourse and the forms of living are constantly separated in, in through contemporary practices, contemporary practices. What does it mean to be contemporary? Uh, and, and also of, uh, reflecting a lot about uh, the po other possibilities of understanding uh, time, space beyond those on the onto epistemological uh, access, such as separability, consequentiality, determinancy, such as as does Denise Ferreira da Silva, for example, points it out in her research. Uh, just just trying to approach the difficulty of understanding ourselves beyond this, of course. Uh, also questioning the identity politics that it has been permeating and being popularized uh, through social media and through, uh, the, let's say, debates that have been permeated through the through the internet. Uh, of course, we don't believe in essentialisms, but from that becomes also a problematization of what of what an essential uh, characteristics come into play in a in a power re relationships in between us, uh, and well. I will say that in in that pro it's a it's a non nonstop process. It's a it's a very uh, also it, it it interpolates us personally, and let's say that we're 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 still working around it in ways to understand it, uh, not as a definitory characteristic of the region, but of, of a of an or of of a political horizon to to motivate whatever comes. Yeah, in, in that sense, we've also kind of um, went beyond editorials, well, like traditional editorials, so to speak. And um, for instance, we also have a traveling exhibition um, called The Center of, of Unfinished Business, um, which is um, it's a, it's a library featuring books, magazines, and, and, and the media uh, that deal with issues of colonialism, but in, in an associative way. And so, you know, we place books uh, on art history, um, you know, side by side with books on economics or Wall Street or Black Wall Streets, and sort of like allow the visitors to sort of like engage um, with different topics in, in, in the way they feel more natural to them. Um, you know, and, and leaving the, the, the room open for, for, for expo exploration, you know, rather than uh, indoctrination. Mm -hmm. um, and we also commission, uh, commission practitioners to write about specific um, or general decolonial work. And, you know, that could be an essay, like this not have to be like a review, although it could also be a review. Um, we, we have a very um, diverse pool of writers. Uh, and, and although I think I can say most are female or, or black and, and of color, 
it does not mean that everyone has to be um so it's not so much about you know identity politics uh and so you don't have to be a person of color to write for us and to work with us um it's also about you know a way a way of thinking um and not so much exactly you know, what you look like and, and what your specific identity is is so to speak uh, we also do um, organize uh, site-specific exhibitions. Um, there's a series of them uh, called uh, "Show Me Your Sh Show Me Your Shelves," and they they usually deal with libraries. Uh, and we invite you know like international artists to come together and create um, art pieces that engage with the with the idea of the library and what does it mean um, for, for knowledge to be uh, archived and stored and produced and so on. Um, we also organize international panels um, and we also do regional print issues um, and sometimes they're often um, organized and developed with uh, the local or regional uh, critical writing workshops that we run, for instance, uh, we, did, we did one with Nairobi. So the, the participants of that workshop developed the print issue that we then um, delivered, distributed on the streets of Nairobi. Thanks, Will, and thanks, Diego. And so <clears throat> another element in terms of topic or focal points that um, I found in both of your biographies, I knew from also knowing you from your work and that um, those who might have been connecting to this talk might have read about is um, queerness. And I wanted to ask you about this in terms of um, your editorial work and the cultural, artistic, social, political implications of your editing platforms. Um, how you understand this notion, how it, it is reflected and addressed and also why it is somewhat an, an important, one of the important pivotal elements. And since words matter, and I guess spelling matters, um, I also wanted to show how I encountered this term in the biographies that you shared with me in advance of the talk. Again, because some people might simply not have seen this before, or maybe yes, and if so, I apologize. But um, two spellings, two different spellings. Um, and I guess, no, they come from a specific positioning maybe. Um, so I wanted to uh, ask you if you just wanna comment on this or tell us a little bit how also this notion enters the editorial work and this process of decoloniality, of thinking decolonially and constituting this new horizon that uh, you were uh, both referring to somehow. So, so Diego wrote queerness with a C, is, is that right? Yes. <laughs> and I wrote it with a K. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, well, to me, it doesn't really matter. I just prefer the K. <laughs> Which is fine. I just, because people would expect this, the English spelling. So I wanted to represent the ways in which you both spelled it, but just as an alternative spelling to the English sort of dominant way of thinking mm -hmm. that notion. So this was just a sample, but I just wanted to ask you more broadly about yeah. uh, this. Yeah, so to me, queerness with a K is, I mean, it's something that I've noticed that's kind of like very specific to Latin America, so to speak. Um, I've seen it m more prevalent there, but I, I personally use it more as a, a queerness, queerness with a K is already a decolonial que queerness with a Q, if that makes any any sense. Um, I mean, colonization was, all, was about subjugating, subjugating certain subjugating certain bodies um, within a specific hierarchy, um, you know, and, and some of those bodies uh, were queer bodies with a K, um, if, if you will, um, whose anti-establishment position, um, you know, gave way to um, ways of being and thinking that go against the grain. Um, and so from the point of view that decolonization is a critique of the modern and the contemporary, uh, then Western notions of queerness um, are embedded in, in this history as well. Um, and so 
to me, queer written with a K is a critique of the Eurocentric term um, queer with a Q, uh, you know, the English one. Um, and, and, we, and, and a critique of all its associations with consumerism and, 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 and capitalism as well. Um, so in that sense, to me, queer with a K is a little bit like Latin X, uh, because this X um, is not just about um, it's not just about the, the the gender whether whether you want to make it neutral or not. It opens it opens the word for everything else. And so with Latinx, you're not just talking about gender. You're talking about race. You're talking about class and 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 you know and everything else. And so it's it's a word that's um, you know it's uh, it, it, it's critical in itself. And it remains open for, you know, criticality um, and whatever else that, um, you know, comes ahead. Well, to add, to add up to what Will said, um, I mean, it's it's a way, write, writing queer with a C is a way to, to locate it or position it in a, a Spanish-speaking uh, region. Uh, to also point out that not forget that queer as a concept comes from the Anglo-Saxon academies. So it, it comes to the region through the academy. So it still, it's still a relation of a north-south relation that, uh, that reinforces the idea of the other in which the, the, anthropomo the anthropological point of view comes from the Anglo-Saxon Academy trying to approach the other that that is the dissident or the non-conforming uh, sexual or gender uh, being in this region. So writing writing it with a C is also following Sayak Valencia, for example, that is an academic uh, from from Tijuana that is trying to allocate or to be being evident the 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 political position that that is in the south or the, or the, or the region. In a in a global in a global dynamic, but I, but it's also following, for example, Yudarkis uh, Espinosa, that also another another thinker and academic uh, from 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 Afrofeminist, and in which we're trying to also doubt uh, or be suspicious of all of, of of those gender and sexual analysis that are still following the illustrated. Uh, Let's say narratives that come from the modern, the modern logic, in which the being uh, dissident, sexual gender dissident in this in this part of the region comes with an understanding of being ahead, in 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 as in like in relation to 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 the to the hegemonic population. Uh, so it's it's to question that to also bring in the the feminist genealogies of the region that had had have has always participated. In, in this questioning of sexual and, and of sexuality and gender, is to make evident that there are, there are uh, experiences that do not fit in this world, that go beyond this world of these intentions of 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 capturing and, and crystallizing uh, uh, the experiences or the disobedient experiences. It's 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 um it's, it's a way of messing up with language. And, and with that rigidity of the academic language, it's to 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 make the possibility of breakups to point out into the the that 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 is beyond what we understand with with our with our uh, modern tools that always position sexual dissidents as a breakthrough. Uh, so it's a way it's a way of of, of altering. Uh, our understanding of of a, of a word that has become global, uh, but it's beyond. Uh, it's it's not possible to understanding in a global uh, unifying way. Thanks for this. And so um, we're about to run out of time. We still have a few minutes, so I encourage those who are watching just to start asking questions. But in the meantime, continuing through this also notion of language, I wanted to point out that both your platforms and publishing projects work, as you mentioned briefly before, across multiple languages. So no way escaping this hegemony of the English only. And I wanted to ask you, 
what are some of the important processes and outcomes um, of working in such a multilinguistic way? And also how is the editorial work that you do navigating the diverse realms of meaning that one encounters, as you both were saying before, right? When switching from one language to another, it's not just a mere exercise of translating one article from one language to the other, it's about knowledge production across different realms of meanings. So I just wanted to ask you if you can tell us a little bit uh, what your thoughts are in this or what experiences have been particularly interesting, which processes were um, yeah, particularly relevant in this effort. Well, for one, it slows down the process <laughs> and it, has, it involves more people. You have more people involved in the, in the editing process and you know, in the thinking that, co that goes behind how the text should be edited. Um, and it's very challenging when it comes to like vernacular, translating vernacular. Um, and although I can I can edit in multiple languages, I can only proofread in English. That's how that's how I do it. Um, but one thing, like one of the things that I really, um, I think, are really important in in working or editing uh, across different languages is sort of like what these other ways of thinking and being remind you of and, and so forth if i'm editing with, with french i'm constantly reminded of um of the importance of, of poetry and allowing room for you know more ambivalence and like more sub subjectivity in in a in an art text but something that wouldn't or doesn't happen so often when you do it uh, with english only Well, in that sense, uh, just note, I, I need to make a correction of what I said before. Uh, when I said that Juberkis is an Afro-feminist, she's not an Afro-feminist. She's an anti-colonial, anti-racist thinker. She has separated herself from feminism since feminism has become a whitening device, uh, mainly in the in the region. But just, just as a note, because if, if, if I present her as an Afro-feminist, I will be like, no. <laughs> uh, anyway, and... Well, regarding the editorial process, well, of course, there is this act of translation to be a bilingual platform, English and Spanish. Uh, I will, I would love to be also a Portuguese uh, platform, but of course, the expenses do not allow me to do it yet. Uh, but of course, it's a way to. It's, it's, the intention is to uh, allow. And in an exchange, allow a conversation to be broader, to to have other possibilities of dissemination. Uh, the editorial process uh, around this will, since we are this uh, a platform advocating for the dissemination of critical thinking, of course there is a certain let's say rigidity uh, of the language that is uh, that is articulated through the context that we generate but it's also looking forward to make it more accessible to make it more easy to uh, to to understand and to and to create genealogies of thinking so each of the essays for example even though they're they are commissioned with an editorial charter that presents some uh, questions some provocations uh, or some uh, context uh, that that allows to to up to to locate the global idea in related to a to a, a very local or specific context uh, the idea the, the idea is to to unfold the possibilities of of dissent the possible the, the the idea of of roses how do you say rose i don't have this one you catch me unprepared. Friction, a friction. Friction, okay. <laughs> the the possibilities of friction. So in in the in a magazine, in what in each of our of our, of our issues, there is uh, an intention or or, or an idea or, uh, that of the order of the of the texts. There is a way in which one is answering to the other, or one is is complementing another one, or, or the other one is totally interpolating and 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 in a, from another point of uh, of view, and another point, another one of the texts. It's, it's it's a way in which we we constellate ideas uh, throughout a team because each of the issue has a thematic frame. 
uh, we it, it, we include from 11 to 12 essays and conversations. Sometimes uh, it goes into poetry or into more, uh, let's say, narrative or, or poetical prose uh, writing. I think uh, the idea is also to, to do it with in, in relation to or in, in, in conversation with the authors. I usually try to make a, a video call which, with with each of, of them to know where I where, how are they where are where are they in the in the in the research they are unfolding uh, how what are their opinions on the on the editorial charter on the theme that we're trying to approach for the issue and well also the idea when we have the budget the, uh, we try to invite a co-editor a guest editor to also as a way of equilibrating my own position as an editor in terms of power, but also as a strategic way to, to know more or to have a, a, a more, more possibilities of, of, of pointing out or pinning, or pinning down uh, contributors to a specific essay. So yeah, the, the way of, of working editorially, uh, it's, it's, it reacts firstly in my case to a, a local context uh, but also, but it, at the same time, it's, di it's in dialogue with other possibilities or other contexts that I see that they have cacophonies. They are they are bursting in the in, in same roots. They are exploring. They are confronting the uh, similar uh, problematics, or or they're interested in 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 a specific similar uh, yeah ways of thinking. Thanks. So again, I'll just. I have a couple more questions. And again, I see that there is one question coming in, but I encourage those who are watching just to jot down any question they might have. Um, I would like to ask you, as you were referencing this also, um, the, about, I wanted to ask you about the conditions in which this process of editorial knowledge production uh, can take place. And I'm thinking, of course, about issues of funding and sustainability, because those are shared struggles, especially for the type of work that you do. But also, um, as you were saying, I think about the importance of um, staying aware and involving new voices or having, I saw there was an open call, for instance, done by Terremoto a few months ago. So really how to articulate, you know, how to, to be vigilant constantly, and also how to stay sustainable. So I wanted to ask you how you are platforms are addressing these issues. And also um, a very important question for me, sort of to know your opinion on this, what do you think still needs to be done uh, to properly um, sort of um, address the key issues that you're trying to address through your editorial work? So you've done a lot of work in this past almost 10 years, but also what do you think still needs to be done? What are some of the key pivotal issues that you're still grappling with um, now? In, in terms of our funding structure, it's a very, it's a very mixed structure. So we have um, governmental institutional funding on one side, and we, you know, we also have adverts. Um, we started developing our ASI series. Um, first one was with Kaponi Kiwango, for instance, um, and, and so, so for different projects we have different um, funding sources, for instance, and um, that is that can be really great because it really allows us to pay our contributors um, like above the average fees, I would say, because um, that also really determines what kind of voices you can have uh, in your editorial, um, meaning that you have a, a wider and more diverse um, spectrum of voices. Um, and we also, we pretty open, we accept, we accept pitches, um, and, and not only from our writers, we also accept pitches from um, anyone that has um, an, an opinion that we think is valuable to uh, and that contributes to to the work that we um, that we do, um, and of course we also have the participants of our workshops who are usually um, very junior writers, very junior um, art writers. Um, in general, I'd just like to say that there's still like a lot of 
hurdles when it comes to uh, young writers to write about art for you know your average art publication uh, in terms of um, accessibility uh, and that with many publications not so easy to get in touch with the um, editorial team for instance um, and there's um, there's also a lot of there's still a lot of gates to be honest uh, and when it comes to to pitching and there's lack of transparency uh, there's still, like a lot of rules in the game whereby um, you know you need specific things in order to you know write an essay for for a publication otherwise you you can only you only consider if you want to write a review or something like this um, and I think yeah and so I think I think these hur these hurdles are are, are an issue that um, in general the industry should um, like do something about. Mm, well, Terremoto has also a mixed uh, model of funding. It comes mainly from a uh, private or uh, from, yeah, from private uh, sector uh, through a program that we have, Terremoto Club, that in which we, uh, let's say we welcome donations from $1,000 to $5,000 in exchange for an artist edition and other, other uh, let's say, yeah, like retributions to the support. We have, of course, the, the, the government or institutional support that it's very, that it's not very, uh, let's say, continuous. It's a sporadic, it depends on the national funding. Uh, of course, right now in Mexico, we have um, austerity law because of not, not only because of the crisis, but also because of the political, the economic, the politics, economic politics of the of of AMLO that is uh, the president in which of course he's trying to redistribute uh the the, the budgets for a, a more uh let's say fair understanding of, of 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 it but it's there's a lot of of yeah of not very convenient things to make to to yeah to have a continuity of our programs so we have, uh, yeah, we have this this uh, continuous support from the government. We also have international grants or international support. For example, last year we have the Prince Claus uh, support for for to to keep on going. Uh, we have the, the the annual auction. Last week was the second one, so it's going to be a year every year. That that also allows allows us to to hit the the half of our, of our of our annual budget, so it's 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 a it's a difficult situation. It's not a, it's not a stable, or not usually stable. We have managed to to grow in, in throughout the twenty twenty year. So right now we're a team of eight people. Uh, there's not only the magazine. There's also an exhibition program for uh, researches around archives, whether they're personal, institutional, or independent. We have an editorial that is Temblores Publicaciones, uh, and we're in the plans of, of developing other programs. Uh, as per challenges, I will say the challenge is to, to make possible our contents to circulate beyond the art sector, because it's, it's still a very reductant and endogamic sector. Uh, it's still a very uh, specific access to very specific people. So I will say that, that that is that is one of the main challenges we have. Of course, the printing uh, option is is allows as a, a different circulation than the online uh, counterpart. Uh, as as per the online, for example, we have now six uh, sections between reviews, reports, opinions. So we're also in in uh, continuous continuously. Uh, trying to develop and diversify the ways to approach uh, critical thinking. Uh, right now, we're, for example, for the opinion and projector are two recent sections. Projector is for uh, video arts or video artworks to be presented uh, per month and, and a specific work. And opinion is a, a section to unfold reflections on, poli on cultural policies. Right now in Mexico specifically, where the intention is to start it opening also beyond the, the country. 
And the challenge of all is that to, to permeate uh, conversations beyond the, our specific sector, to be uh, to be considered as a media with other medias that are not only advocated to to culture or to the or to the arts, and I will say that also to to to, to translate uh, more uh, knowledge that is that is not being uh, circulating beyond academic or beyond uh, geographical uh, limits. Thank you, and then to close. I just would like to ask you about recommended readings. Let's use this word for, for me, of course, and for those who are watching this. Um, so I just wanna ask you, which are some of the articles that have come out recently or maybe not, but on both of your platforms that you would list somewhat as a must read and why? I know there's a lot, so I'm asking you a difficult question, but just to, to, to highlight, a a couple of elements that could be particularly interesting. And then we will um, we will uh, share these links on the on the talks page for people to to be able to access them. Okay. Uh, I would I'd really like to suggest this uh, very recent um, article by the art historian um Gursoy, uh, Do Do uh, Dotas. Um, who analyzes the power imbalances between Andy Warhol and his um, BPOC queer trans cities in Lower Manhattan. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, an article, it's actually sadly an, an obituary on two female uh, Kenyan artists um, who deal with um, well, feminist issues and queer issues in. In, in Kenya, and they both uh, from different generations, and they both uh, passed away in the past few months. Um, from CNAL, I'd love to suggest a conversation with Nain Terina, um, who is the um, on the first show uh, of Indigenous art um, at. Um, at the Pinacoteca de São Paulo, um, which is older than a hundred years, but they've never had a, a show with with indigenous art, and um, and also an interview with Sandra Benitez, the first Brazilian indigenous curator to be hired on the staff um, at the MASP in Brazil as well. I'll and I'll I'll send you the links right now. Thank you. From yeah, my well, part, there there are yes. several. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. From our current issue, I will say uh, first one will be a uh, text written by the Comunidad Catrileo Carrion, that is uh, uh, from Mapuche artists and creators and thinkers. Uh, that is called Comunidad Catrileo Carrion Mapuche Non Binary Utopias for an Epupillan Present. So they, they are posing uh, other ways of living beyond the heteropatriarchal regime and drawing to poetics of imagination uh, for to understanding our, our existence uh, also be, uh, also as a way to, as an anti-patriarchal uh, intention. Then we have, if, of that same issue, there is uh, Soy Bot, the cur curator Soy Bot uh, wrote a text called Finding Kindred Beyond Blood and Bo or Border, also of, of the role of friendship and affinity uh, in, in, in her, practice as a curator in Southeast Asia. There is another text from our past issue, the 18th issue that is called Of Passageways and Portals. Uh, this, is a, this is a text wrote by Siobhan Guerrero. It's called post Buddhismo and Utopia, in which he addresses the issues faced by sex workers during the health contingency and to question affecting the scope of feminist utopia. There is on, the, on that same issue, the 18th issue, a uh, text wrote by Tiffany Barber and Reynaldo Anderson that it's called The Black Angel of, of History and the Age of Necrocapitalism, in which they are reaffirming the relevance of Afrofuturism, legacy and vision in the present, while also questioning uh, the anti-racist movements uh, through the figure of the Angel of History of Walter Benjamin. There is also a text uh, by Duen Sachi. Uh, uh, I'm... I'm I have a crush 
an intellectual crush with Duen. Uh, he wrote Epidermia, that is also in the in the frame of the 18th issue, in which he reexamines our uh, our corporality as a place of negotiation and encounter of oneself and others, uh, to also unfold critical research to deconstruct to deconstruct uh, hygienist fantasies, and well, there is the the whole issue of planetary solidarity, uh, that is the the issue that uh, finished circulation a week ago, and right now it's it's, it's totally the, the index is completed. Uh, and available in online. There is a, a, a really good text with uh, Gay Chan and Drew Kahuanya that is from Hawaii towards common ground in an occupied nation in which they also question ideas of identity, solidarity, and, and social practices uh, beyond the scope of, of art, or uh, let's say noting that the limits of art are, are not uh, optimal for other political intentions. And I will say those for a start. <laughs> Thank you. This is wonderful. Thank you so very much to both of you. In the meantime, just a quick question came through, but it's more lateral, but I just want to show it anyway. I think it's important just in case you have more suggestions. Uh, someone asks whether you have suggestions for video platforms. Um, for BIPOC works. Um, I don't know whether in your work you have encountered anything that might be relevant or whether you would perhaps draw it back to some of the articles that you just mentioned or sort of this knowledge production process that, that you've been cultivating through your respective platforms. Not specific, I'm thinking still. Um, how ever i would actually i forgot to mention it but we also have um one of our projects uh, it's a series of commissions and we commission um artists to create works and so far they have been mostly video works mm -hmm. and um i can share the link with you so it's called c and commissions and uh i think so far we've had three or four and um yeah and it's mostly video works and so so we have that um but thinking about a platform specifically for um yeah i'm still thinking well this is already a good start here it is this is what will just sent well we have in Toronto, we have this section that is projector uh it's it's barely new so we have very very few contributions so far but the, inten the intention is to host uh, video works of artists of the region who mainly are uh, queer people of color. And well, I will say that uh, El Museo de la Solidaridad in Chile also has been commissioning uh, video works to artists around the uh, around them, of the, around that institution. Uh, I will say, I'm thinking, like on a specific video platform. Hmm. No, it doesn't. It, it comes to mind only what is doing the Museo Solidaridad. Well, the, the right now the triennial the um, of of the Sesc in Brazil is mm -hmm. also also has a lot of of video program because of the pandemic. Um, let me. See. Think. And maybe we can post the links if something comes to yeah. mind afterwards. But it's great because already, like this, we got to learn about yeah. what. Also, both in Mexico, are. in Mexico, there is the PAC that is a, a private foundation called El Patronato de Arte Contemporáneo. Contemporary patronage can be the translation. Uh, they launched a mini site also in which they are, uh, yeah, constellating practices that they have supported throughout the last year. They come mainly from people of color. And yeah, I think I, I think those are the ones that come to my mind. That's a lot. So thank you both for ready for this. Well, I guess we our time is up. So I just want to thank you so very much for your time, for being so generous with the knowledge you've shared. I well, enjoyed very much. Um, My pleasure. To, thank you, Will.
Thank you, Diego. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, and Will. <laughs> and um, for those who are watching still, I just want to remind everybody that we will be back with a new conversation in April, and we will announce the speaker soon. So as always, I just share the link to the talks page. Here we will condense all the links and the articles we've discussed. And also I wanna just show the email address in case anybody has a question or feedback or a question for Diego and Will, we're happy to act as a, as a connector after the fact. So um, thank you, thank you both. And hopefully until soon, take care. Thank you. Bye.